for people who don't know, um, you have been Prime Minister uh, for five years um, as leader of the Left Green Party, um, but in coalition with more than one group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, quite an achievement. Um, in, in 2019, uh, you took Iceland into the Wellbeing Economy Government Alliance uh, with five other countries, uh, New Zealand, Finland and Scotland, all of whom also led by women, and one led by a man, uh, Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, as part of that development, maybe it would have happened anyway, but at the same time, you set out wellbeing indicators which are going to guide the government. Um, and we're really looking forward to hear the thinking beh behind all of this and how it's influencing what you have done, what you're going to do. So please welcome the Prime Minister of Iceland. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor to be invited here to this distinguished university and be able to have this conversation with you on a very important topic, well-being. Um, I welcome this opportunity, actually, to be part of today's critical discussions and share with you my political views on the subject. And because you've so kindly mentioned, and actually the panel here before mentioned the fact that there are female or women leaders who are actually leading this. I think personally that the world would be a much better place if we would have more women leaders. <laughs> because, well, it's good that we agree on this because I think actually the fact is that women's experience is actually very valuable when we're talking about the well being of the population. I was brought up in the well, I'm born in 1976, and in Iceland we then had, shortly after, uh, in the early 80s, we had a political party that was all women's party. And they were always talking about the experience of women, and everybody laughed at them and said, they are ridiculous. Why should women's experience matter, and how is that different? But we have really learned, and I think one of the reasons for the fact that Iceland is at the top of gender gap uh, index uh, published yearly is the fact that these women actually paved the way for those of us who came later and changed the system and structures in Iceland so it's actually possible for women to uh, take equal part in politics, business, etc. But a little bit on today's topic and I would like to share with you how my country is really endeavoring to implement the concept of the well-being economy an economy that pursues human and ecological well-being instead of simply material growth, and how we aim to establish this policy paradigm to develop and assess social and economic progress. Now, you have been talking about this, so I won't repeat what we have been talking about, but absolutely we have joined this group of smaller countries in the well-being economy governments, and actually, uh, the frame of that is also working within the context of the UN 2030 agenda, the SDGs that were mentioned here earlier. Uh, the project entails an analysis of the shortcomings of traditional economic theory and policy together with a commitment to build an alternative future, focusing on the well-being of current and future generations. And we are very committed to a vision in which economic policy support collective well-being by focusing on how happy and how healthy a population is. And this approach allows us to examine the quality of life above and beyond monetary measures such as GDP, and also to take advantage of scientific knowledge to follow a sustainability agenda where no one is left behind. Now, I must confess that I am not an academic. I'm a politician. Uh, and during my studies, I actually studied Icelandic crime fiction. So uh, <laughs> I won't be able to make an academic input here that is uh, worthy of those of you listening. However, I try to read and follow up because I think it's very important that we who are in politics try to understand what we're doing. And I would like to mention uh, Tipur Sitaski 
who in 1972 lamented that we eat not what is good, but what is good for us. And of course, as a responsible politician, I can't possibly object to people following a healthy diet, but Sitarsky was making the broader point that welfare had been equated with the quantity of consumption, while consumption does not only vary, vary in quantity, but also in quality. He maintained that it is possible for societies with fewer resources to attain higher quality consumption than many more affluent societies who, in his view, tended to prioritize quantity over quality, thus taking the joy out of many activities for the sake of efficiency, productivity, and profit. And around the same time, another economist, Fred Hirsch, observed that there were social as well as ecological limits to growth. And for me, his key insight was that some goods are inherently positional in that the pleasure we derive from them stems in large part from their scarcity. If, society be, if societies become richer and the greater range of goods become widely available, the competition for positional goods persists, leaving people richer but less happy on account of social comparisons. And both Sitarsky and Hirsch thus gave us reasons to doubt that increasing production and quantitative consumption would increase social welfare. Yet, since the mid 20th century, we have tended to measure social progress in monetary terms, with GDP being the predominant indicator, though it should be noted that Simon Kuznets was at pains to point out that the GDP was simply a measure of the volume of an economy and should not be used as an indicator of social welfare. Obviously, human beings are more than producers and consumers of goods, and any approach to individual and social welfare must reflect this. Human well-being, to borrow from the Finnish sociologist Erik Allert, consists not only of having, but also of loving and being. But there we come back to the women, because I don't think it's considered very masculine to talk about love or happiness when you're a male politician. I don't know what you think here in the room, but I think it's more somehow acceptable for us women in politics to say, well, politicians should actually think about how happy the population is. At least, you know, there are a lot of men here, but I don't hear many of my male colleagues talk about this. Now, because when you're in politics, you really have to think, what are you going to do? You have to raise the quality of life for people, right? And that does not mean that we simply dispense with wealth, but rather that economic growth is desirable in so far that it can be harnessed to increase well-being without devastating ecological consequences. That growth is not a goal in and of itself. Now, I would... Oh, pussy. Ops. This fell. Now, I would like to tell you a little bit about Iceland. I will try to stop this. Now, I started in politics in 2007. Uh, I actually uh, was pregnant when I became a parliamentarian. I then had a, a maternal leave, and when I came back, we had an economic crisis in 2008. And it actually hit Iceland exceptionally hard. Uh, we were a little bit like the cannery and the coal man in 2008, and it both resulted in economic and political crisis, but it also served as a watershed moment and uh, actually provided the impetus for adopting a well-being economy framework. Because even though the crisis was very tough, and it was tough on the population, it was tough on Icelandic politics, it sparked mass protests, we also experienced the demand for change. Uh, we experienced the demand for increased accountability from the administration. And the shakeup of widespread assumptions opened up a broader spectrum of ideas, triggering a very energetic rethinking of our objectives as a society. Uh, I became a minister in 2009, uh, Minister for Education, Culture and Research, in a left-wing government that was in power from 2009 to 13. And one of my projects actually involved forming and implementing a new curriculum, which included education on equality, democracy and sustainability, and also education on health and welfare. Because we really wanted to implement the thought that welfare is something that you need to think about when you just simply start your education. Another key project 
was also to build the bridge between the education system and uh, the unemployment system, trying to motivate those who lost their jobs, and there were thousands of them in 2008 in Iceland, to actually seek education or retrain. And several thousand people went through that program. You know, in Iceland, we really hadn't experienced unemployment until that moment. So it was a very new thing for us. We have always had a very low unemployment rate. But I think it was one of the most rewarding efforts I have actually participated in as a politician because it really showed me and proved how policy actually can impact people's everyday lives. And so often we're in politics implementing some Let's say, yeah, I know you're not doing that now in the UK, but in Iceland we're implementing EU regulation on the financial markets and it somehow seems very far away and distant from the everyday life of people, even though it's very important in itself. So, but some things we do actually really make the lives of people better. So when I returned to government in 2017, then as prime minister, heading a very different government because my coalition actually has three parties from the right to the left. I really wanted to continue the work on well-being and create a new framework. So in 2019, we introduced 39 indicators to track the progress of a well-being economy. And the indicators include economic, environmental, labor markets, social factors, are compatible with well-being indicators published in other countries, but also by international organizations like the OECD. And the preparation of those indicators was pan-political. I actually see one here in the room, Kristin Balla, who actually participated in that project and included actually an opinion poll, which was very interesting because it asked the population what they valued most in their private life, but also what they valued most in their society. And health was at top on both lists. And it often occurred to me during the pandemic how really decisive those results were and how important it was to think about that, that this was really what the people valued most, both for them personally, but also in society. Now, actually, uh, after that, we have integrated six well-being priorities into the government's five-year fiscal strategy, and we have been utilizing the expertise from gender budgeting, which we introduced into state budgeting in 2015. Now, the six priorities are mental health, and that is something, that is a challenge in Iceland. We have a uh, high usage of uh, antidepressants in Iceland. We have a strong demand of better uh, health uh, services for those who suffer from, from uh, uh, problems in, in mental health. And one of the things that we have been doing is doubling the number of psychologists working in public health care because of this emphasis on mental health. Secure housing is another priority. Uh, in Iceland, we, had, uh, we have had a, a drastic changes in our housing market, but what's happening now is that now we are actually reintroducing public housing in cooperation between the government and the labor unions. And actually, one third of all new homes in 2020 and 21 was built uh, or supported by uh, public social initiatives. The third priority is a better work-life balance. And I could mention two examples. We extended the parental leave from nine months to 12 months. And the other important factor is that it's shared equally between both parents. So it's not just uh, a priority for our family policy, but also for gender equality. And one thing that we have seen, because we measure what the people think about this, is that men are actually more positive in Iceland than anywhere else in becoming fathers and being with their children. And we also see very clear indicators that children who have been brought up during this new system, because this was first done in the year 2000 to have this shared parental leave, so we're actually now having children that have grown up, they actually have a very different view on uh, gender stereotypes than earlier generations, because they have actually experienced their fathers participating more in the upbringing of children. Now, a better work-life balance, another very important project is a shorter working week. Now, I could mention carbon neutrality, uh, a fourth priority, uh, and there I could talk for ages on our climate policy, uh, but there have been several very strong actions, for example, concerning new taxes and other ones lifted to accelerate energy transition. Innovation growth, we have uh, 
increased R&D funding and seen export revenues from innovation grow substantially, which is very important for a resource-dependent society like Iceland. And then strengthen information and communication to the public, including increased emphasis on public consultation when preparing legislation. And I could, because I know you've been talking a little bit about the pandemic and its influence uh, on happiness and well-being, that we had a very clear information strategy during the pandemic, where the main goal was to keep the public informed at all times. Uh, that meant actually that the professionals had uh, daily meetings where they informed the public. It was actually so popular that it topped everything else in television. And it was a very, and it was a, a really mindful decision that the politicians should not be there all the time. That the director of health and the chief epidemiologist, they would be there because we did not want to politicize, politicize the pandemic. We wanted to have it a clear distribution of information and that actually resulted in the fact that the spread of disinformation was very small in Iceland during the pandemic. Now, Statistics Iceland monitors the well-being aspects of people's lives on an ongoing basis through a set of indicators, and they provide us, the policymakers, with a systematic assessment of the impacts expected or achieved by policies. Now, I think, because I mentioned the pandemic, um, and it's still very high in all of our minds, and it's still on the rise, actually, it just goes on, and the following economic crisis um, actually have brought the well-being framework's importance into even sharper relief. Um, the historian William H. McNeil argued in his seminal book, Plagues and People, from 1976, that health crisis often serves as a reflection of society. And the truth of this is becoming even more evident in the current post-COVID times, where we continue to struggle with one of the worst recessions of our times. Um, while traditions, cultures and norms have shaped policy responses to the pandemic's socio-economic challenges, those responses also reveal the capacity of different societies to cope with challenges, learn from experiences and build resilience against future shocks. And I think also, moreover, that the pandemic and related crisis point to the urgent need for transformative programs to counter the climate crisis. Um, it was really a reality check for everyone to realize that environmental degradation, biodiversity loss and pollution could lead to more epidemics impacting our health and economies. And in that context, we can allow ourselves to see the post-COVID phase as a window of opportunity for systematic change with transformative and evidence-based policies, something that is increasingly demanded by the public. Now, I think... Actually, it's too early to predict the extent of the socio-economic damage caused by COVID-19 and uncertainty, uncertainties on where that virus is actually going and, and new, uh, new uh, var variants all coming you know, into light. They may further challenge our economy's capacity to cope with long-term pandemics. According to a recent research by uh, international organizations like the OECD, Iceland, like the other Nordic countries, has, by international comparison, shown strong resilience in withstanding the threats of the pandemic and is well situated to make a steady long-term recovery. And I think, actually, their confidence and trust are really important factors that actually people had confidence. They don't necessarily have confidence in us politicians. Not in Iceland, not anywhere, really. But they had confidence in the institutions and in the system, in this health system. And so they showed an incredible resilience to participate in all sorts of social restrictions. And they could also feel actually that we were in this aspect all on the same boat, if I may say so. Uh, there were everybody really who had to make drastic changes to their lives. And when we actually entered the phase of vaccinations, we were very clear also that it was done in an H uh, row. So the oldest people were first, and then those who uh, were next oldest and all that. And actually I thought, I met an American filmmaker who met me in the queue waiting for my first vaccinations. And she was like, are you here in a queue? And I was like, yes, of course, because now it's the 1976 who are going to have their vaccination. And I think this was very important because it really felt like there's the prime minister and there's this guy and we are just doing this kind of together. 
And it was a very, again, mindful decision to do that, because if you want to, the public to have confidence in your institution, the public must feel that they are, we are all part of that same team. Uh, now, I could also mention that uh, the economic measures were also, we tried to focus them not only on the companies, but obviously we were very severely hit. Tourism is huge in Iceland, and all of a sudden there was no tourism. So it was quite, uh, uh, it was quite disastrous for our economy. So we had a very strong economical support for our companies, but we tried to make the connection that people were to stay in their jobs, uh, that we also uh, tried to make a certain uh, amendments so that we actually could keep up people's ability to live, to pay the rent, etc. So actually, now, if we look at the situation now, we are doing quite well. We are doing remarkably well. And it's very interesting to see that tourism is really back to what it was before COVID, because we managed somehow to keep everybody like hibernating during those two years. Uh, the average household incomes, I know we should not talk about economic measures in a conference about happiness, but they did not decline due to the pandemic. And I think it was also important that we try to keep the routine going. Uh, elementary schools and preschools stayed open uh, al almost throughout the entire pandemic. And I think that was very important for the children and their routine, and they actually were getting their education, but it was also important for gender equality. Uh, because if the children had been at home, we know who would have been there with them. Now, it's interesting to see a new report from the Nordic statistical offices that shows that while births in most countries worldwide have declined since the onset of COVID, birth rights increased in all the Nordic countries in both 2020 and 2021. So you can see actually, you might draw the deduction that young people trusted the public sector to compensate for the loss of income due to childbirth despite the deep economic downturn. And then, of course, people had nothing to do, so therefore it was very good to have children. <laughs> now, I know, and I was reading, uh, actually, a new happiness report where uh, the Nordic countries all uh, have a very high level of happiness. And I think what we can say about that is that actually more equal and more inclusive societies, they have more robust economic, economies, they have better businesses, but they also uh, provide a society where people actually value their happiness higher than elsewhere. But I must also confess that adopting a well-being framework is just the one milestone on a longer journey and maybe solves nothing in and of itself. It allows us a broader view. It reveals issues that have previously been neglected. I mentioned mental health. And there, again, we have a huge challenge. So I think shifting the policy focus to act on this, it does not happen quickly, because old habits die hard. And the state is a ship that turns very slowly. And uh, I can't really say what will happen if we would have a different government in Iceland, uh, whether they would continue this work. But I think it's a very important work, because it's really all about long-term vision. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that Iceland has been on, on top of the gender gap uh, list for several years now. We have been working on this for decades and years to implement gender equality in Iceland. But we still have, for example, a very gender segregated labor market. We still have uh, uh, m more women than men that work part time. Uh, that really reflects that women have a larger share in unpaid work. We have also the tendency that women leave the labor force earlier than men, relying on early retirement, rehabilitation, or disability benefits. And this is not least true, this is not least true for women who work in care and education, emotionally and physically demanding jobs that are becoming more complex by the day. And this negatively affects the income of women, career development, and future pensions. So we need to really include these in our analysis. Care work is something that has been defined as one of the areas that artificial intelligence will struggle to take over. It will continue to be very important, uh, not least the emotionally charged labor associated with paid and unpaid care 
And this is something that we need to think about if we really want to develop a well-being economy. Um, so I think actually to ensure a gender balance in employment is essential for women's financial independence and the key element in ending gender inequalities, including violence against women, but to achieve a better balance by increasing women's participation in the labor market, we need to create conditions under which they can do so. Obviously, the Nordic countries have made a major contributions on this front. I have mentioned the parental leave. I would also like to mention universal childcare. And I definitely would not be here as a prime minister because I have three sons and I would definitely not be here if they, we hadn't been able to take shared parental leave and if we wouldn't have had accessible universal child care, which is really where everybody has equal access. And that is so important because this is one of the structures that needs to be in place if we want to achieve gender equality. Now, um, I know that I'm probably talking for too long, so I will just <laughs> continue a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I know you want to have some questions, so, so I, will, I, will, I will try to be a little shorter. Um, but I mentioned confidence and trust. And we actually see that deaths from COVID-19 in 2020 and 2021, they have actually been significantly lower in countries with a high level of trust in public institutions and where social inequality is lower. Um, but still, I mentioned that we were kind of all in the same boat and I was in the queue and everybody were kind of dealing with the same issue. But still, we have seen that the crisis had asymmetric health and social impacts across different groups in Iceland, which unveiled existing social inequalities. And it's always very tempting to be a prime minister and say everything is perfect where I come from, but it is not so. And those who were actually hit the hardest were vulnerable groups whose lives were negatively affected by closures of public services and unemployment. So I think actually the pandemic showed us that we have even more challenges to deal with than we thought before. Um, we also saw that uh, uh, as the virus spread, women working in the public sector formed really the frontline services protecting the most vulnerable, resulting in a very noticeable increase in exhaustion among workers and flight from healthcare professions. And I think it's the same in all of our countries, actually. Um, I think also uh, we saw, and it's important this, we witnessed a significant increase in violence against women and children, especially domestic violence. And it is really, because I sometimes meet colleagues they, and they tell me, you know what, we don't have any gender-based violence in my country. And I say, really? Because we have loads of it in Iceland. And domestic violence is actually around 50% of all violent crimes in Iceland. And that tells us quite a story because we are actually doing very well in gender equality, but we have put a very strong emphasis on to register those crimes and think about them as crimes. We did not think about domestic violence as a crime when I was a kid. Then it was just very sad that somebody was beating up his wife. It was not considered to be a crime. But this has changed drastically and this is something that we need to eradicate. It is crazy. We saw actually the number of reported rapes drop because we closed the bars and, uh, you know, I don't know what you call other places where people go out and drink and have fun. And now we are trying to say it's very good to have fun, but you don't need to rape somebody while you're having fun. And because the numbers dropped actually around 43% when we closed those places. Now, um, finally, uh, uh, I think I must say that obviously there are many challenges ahead. I have mentioned the economic challenges. We face a crisis caused by an armed conflict in Europe. Uh, millions of people urgently needing aid and assistance, um, which really shows us that peace is always the precondition for prosperity and well-being. And when we have a war going on, somehow, everything becomes so futile when talking about well-being and prosperity. So I, could, I think uh, 
I think actually the recent years have been challenging, both domestically and internationally. The COVID pandemic has brought very complex societal challenges and other crises will follow. And I haven't even spoken about the climate crisis, which is in the end a story of a deeply flawed economic policy where the more affluent countries have contributed most to the problem, but tend to be the least affected by it. And I think it's fair to say that the climate crisis poses one of the greatest threats to human rights we have ever collectively faced. It directly threatens the lives and well-being of individuals and communities around the globe with vulnerable and marginalized groups disproportionately affected. And when it comes to addressing the global climate emergency and improving the well-being of current and future generations, it is especially pressing to envision a different leadership <coughs> approach. Because the climate crisis is really forcing us to rethink our way of life, our modes of consumption, production and transportation, and how these might threaten our future. Averting a climate crisis may come at a considerable economic cost, but that cost does not have to translate into a decrease in well-being. Moving from a narrow focus on volumes of production and consumption to a broader view of well-being may enable us to preserve the overall quality of people's lives through better use of resources by emphasizing human needs over economic growth. So I think I will just conclude now because I want to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you. But I think also that um, this theme of this conference, it's so important for us policymakers and politicians. And the problem is that we are always dealing with elections in politics. Uh, our terms are usually four years, sometimes shorter, as you know very well. <laughs> I won't say anything more. I dare not speak of this, no. <laughs> I can't say anything because we had, a rather, uh, we had a rather politically unstable condition in Iceland uh, where we had many unexpected elections, so we know the feeling, let's say that. But uh, what we're talking about here is really all about long-term vision. And therefore, I think it's also very important that this discussion takes place not just with the politicians, but with academics, uh, businesses, NGOs, etc., because we need to have a change in our culture. So it doesn't just. So we won't see policy line, like what we are working on in Iceland being dropped if there is a new government. We need to change the culture, so we will continue to work uh, on this very important issue. Uh, so I th I'm very happy about this conference and being able to participate and I look forward to follow future developments in well-being research and towards a very fruitful collaboration between scholars and policymakers in the field because as we all know, whether it's, it's the pandemic or the climate crisis, we really need to have that close cooperation to achieve progress for our people. Thank you.